Gehring from the Thomson Reuters Foundation. We work on uh, covering issues around climate change and the uh, impacts of it. And agriculture is one of the big things we look at because obviously that's a huge issue around the world in many of the countries that are trying to deal with this problem. Our, our event tonight is about the economic advantage of agriculture and the NDCs. I think you probably most of you are aware if you've looked at all at these NDCs, that there's a huge number of them. I think it's 92% of countries have agriculture prominently in what they'd like to do as their national contribution to climate action. So, so it's clear there's demand there. And we know also that many of these countries, um, particularly the, the quite poor ones, are going to need financial support to do that. They, they, a lot of what's promised in the NDCs depends on finance flowing to make that possible. So then the question is, how, how do you show donors who've got a lot of people knocking on the door for the very limited money that's available, that this is the best way to spend their money and that this is actually gonna work and be money well used and not wasted? Well, that, that's what we're here to talk about today. There's been some interesting research and work that suggests that putting money into agriculture actually can be well spent if certain uh, conditions are met. And, and there's an interesting breakdown of sort of how this is playing out in very various parts of the world, including Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So we've got representatives from those various parts of the world that'll be here to talk about their parts that they know. Um, we're going to start um, with an opening presentation by Sonia Vemelen from CCFS and the University of Copenhagen. She'll take about 20 minutes to run you through a presentation. And then we're going to have a moderated dialogue among our panelists tonight and the audience. So get your questions ready. We have Alaria Fermion from IFAD. We have Peter Laderach from SIAT. We have Chebet Maikut from Uganda, one of the negotiators. We have Dada Bakuda, who is here representing ASEAN and the German Program on Response to Climate Change. So they'll each have a, we'll, we'll have a discussion with this group of people and then we'll uh, welcome your questions and uh, then we'll have a wrap up at the end and try to get to some of the main points. So uh, without taking much longer, I wanna hand over to Sonia to run through her presentation. Good evening and hi everyone. I'll, I'll take the chance to stand up because I tend to like waving my arms around. Um, IFAD, uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, has invited us. We're a research team, CCAFS, that's the CGIR Research Programme on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, to look into the issue around the economics of, of agriculture and climate change. So very happy to take up the challenge. A long list of authors, as you see there, has, has got involved in this. It's not working. Ah, ah, sorry. A preview of slides to come. Okay. So what, what, what we really observed is that while agriculture has taken ages to get onto the negotiating table, what we're seeing now is almost every party in the world is signing up in their nationally determined contributions for actions on agriculture, either in the mitigation space or if they're including adaptation there as well. Um, so this is, this is almost universal and it's new and it gives us a whole new platform for action. On the other hand, when you look a little bit more closely at some of the costings around this or the estimation of benefits, there's a massive range. So these are the figures from Africa um, and you'll see there's a, there's a huge range going on here. And not to pick on countries in particular, but you'll see some strong contrast there. So that for DRC, for instance, sees a huge costs around mitigation, but fairly low costs around adaptation. Whereas Benin is exactly the opposite with the bulk of costs and adaptation and very little in mitigation. So this kind of gave us the sense that many of these figures um, are not yet well developed, that countries in the next stage of iteration will be wanting to really strengthen their estimates of costs and benefits and in particular, if they're going to be putting in applications to the Green Climate Fund, Africa Development Bank, or these other major sources of climate finance. So we took it upon ourselves to say, okay, well, what do we know right now? Um, so we've done this at three levels, from the global level through to a 
national policy project level and then right down to the farm and landscape level, what do you do on the ground? Um, and we've done a mix of some new ex ante research, i.e. that's modeling about what will happen in the future, um, and also some new empirical research, you know, what, what's actually been observed in terms of returns to investment. And we supplemented that with, with um, a literature review of, of previous studies that have been done. The first message, of course, is, is that, that that information is really, really patchy. So what I'm giving you today is not the definitive answer, but it is a collection of interesting information which we hope you can apply in your work. So first of all, just to take a step back, one of the things we haven't done in this report is to look at the actual costs of climate change to agriculture. Now, we have had a lot of talk about this, and just to share with you two topical examples, the news from the wine industry this year is, is that with the El Nino events, it's been hit really hard. Um, countries like Argentina, South Africa, Chile are reporting massive losses in yields and associated with that losses in the industry to, um, to jobs. Um, I will also mention here that other countries such as New Zealand have actually benefited this year, so that's not universal. Um, at the same time, the kinds of actions that we take also have socio-economic knock-on effects. So at the moment, we're seeing these huge air pollution issue in Delhi. 1,800 schools have closed. Um, the newspaper today was describing people cowering by their air, air purifiers. Um, one of the main drivers of this are the raging fires um, across the Punjab as farmers burn their stubble. There's a strong economic driver at the moment for them to do this. Um, they would dearly love to be selling that straw and stubble into the market. They simply can't afford the startup costs for the threshing machines they need to do that. This gives you a bit of an idea of some of the key economic drivers behind why we need to act. So going into the study now, um, the first big message that I'd like to give you is, is looking at IFAD's ASAP program. This is the Adaptation and Smallholder Agriculture program. It's currently the biggest fund in the world to support actions by smallholders um, in adaptation. Now, they've done um, a big ex ante study to say, is this going to give positive returns over time? Um, the really good news is, is that in every single one of the 32 countries that they work in, using quite conservative estimates of the returns, they do expect to see positive impacts, and those positive impacts are actually returning to farmers. The other really good news is, this isn't just one type of action that they're doing everywhere. They have a huge spread of the types of things that they're doing. And in particular, they're emphasizing building local farmers' organizations. That's a, a capacity-building approach to climate change rather than just a purely, let's do a technical fix. Um, on the whole, they will be generating uh, net present values of around uh, six, $7 million in each of these countries. Perhaps on the uh, more cautious side, do be aware that these are purely ex ante modeling figures, and IFAD has in place monitoring systems to see if they really are meeting these targets. And it also depends on a fairly high rate of adoption amongst farmers of around 60%. The other good news is that the kinds of actions that they're undertaking are robust amongst, uh, across a range of climate futures. So you'll see that they're above the uh, kind of the level of the discount rate of 10%, um, even if climate change is more advanced and has greater impacts on the agriculture sector than we expect it to. Another interesting study, which is also ex ante, is looking at the rice sector globally, and it's saying, let's, let's imagine what will happen if we globally implement some really promising technologies, alternate wetting and drying, which is controlling the level of water in rice paddy. And the other one is a precision fertilizer uh, uh, um, intervention called urea deep placement. Again, the expectation is that this, this, these kinds of interventions can massively lower greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, improve productivity and reduce rice prices. Perhaps the qualifier here is that reduced rice prices are great for consumers, of course, 
but are less positive for the producers. And the study has not yet factored in the kinds of uh, income effects on small farmers. But overall, at least from ex ante modeling, we have the generic message that investing in agriculture is going to be positive. Um, it really is going to work as a climate change solution. Going to the more national level, this is where countries are really interested in making decisions and economic analysis can help with some of the very difficult choices that need to be made. So if you give me a second to talk you through. Um, this, this is an analysis which the government of Colombia did for, for its own NDC to decide what to do. So it's looking at the uh, trade-offs between profits on the vertical axis and green, greenhouse gas emissions on the horizontal axis. So they looked at one of their, their current policies is the expansion of palm oil um, to, to a much greater area of 1.5 million hectares. This really doesn't make any difference at all um, in terms of the emission changes. And actually in profit terms, it's going to look pretty negative because they're not taking out unused land. They will be putting that palm oil in place of coffee, cocoa, and other perennial crops. There's a similarly uh, not that good news story for reducing the Amazon deforestation rate. You can have a positive effect on emissions, but uh, your, your uh, profitability is really not great. The good news story that emerges is around pasture reduction, where you can see uh, with intensification of pasture, positive impacts both for profits and for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And this helped Colombia to decide this was the way to go. Given, given that these kinds of benefits accrue at, at different uh, timescales, many countries are finding it useful to categorize the kinds of economic analyses they do and the actions that they take in terms of dealing with current risks, the current variability you're, you're facing right now, where the economic returns are almost immediate, versus near future risks, which are more about looking at some of your locked-in investments and ensuring that those are uh, le su suitable for your possible range of climate futures. So, for example, the siting of a coffee processing factory or a uh, livestock processing factory. Then the final area is in longer-term risks and preparing now with uh, early monitoring research um, to prepare for the long-term futures that we might see. And indeed, this is one of the most important areas for investment. If you look again at what IFAD's doing with ASAP, about half of its investment isn't going on technical issues, it's going on institution building and capacity building measures. You'll see a very, very tiny little area here, which is work around policy and legal frameworks. These can be areas where the actual costs involved are tiny, but the leverage is massive. So, for example, um, putting in place kinds of incentives for private companies to have proper adaptation and mitigation plans, particularly that benefit smallholder farmers. Um, amongst the kinds of services that are presented there, some of them really stand out. Our economic information on most of them is weak, but some are better studied. And a real standout here are climate information services, recently reviewed by WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. Without fail, they deliver positive benefit to cost ratios, um, particularly at national level. But occasionally, when they do also look at it at household level, we also see outstanding figures of up to 36 to 1 in terms of returns. Most of the NDCs in their agriculture then specify very local level, and these are the farm and landscape level interventions. We see NDCs specifying these across multiple subsectors. Um, soil and land and livestock stand out as, as the most popular. And I won't go into any detail here, but in the report that we prepared out of this, we've prepared a guide which is to help countries find out, or other users, find out where there is more and where there is less um, economic information about a range of different prescribed practices. And one of the things we have looked at is how these play out for different groups of farmers um, within society. 
we do know, of course, that that kind of differentiation for farmers is absolutely important. Um, Peter will be talking about this some more. Um, he's the person behind the study. But for it, here's an example um, where in Nicaragua, we have, we're going to see a massive reduction in the future of suitable crop, coffee growing areas. And this leads to very, very different recommendations for high, medium, and lower altitude in terms of whether you uh, build up your coffee crop, whether you transition from coffee into cocoa, or whether you focus on your cocoa productivity. Again, all with financial data which were available for that. Similarly, in uh, Vietnam, there's a move in the IFADS ASAP program to encourage farmers to shift out of rice and into coconuts and sugarcane. Every single farmer in, in the program agrees that this is a great thing to do, but whether it's doable or not for them depends on their economic status. So for higher income farmers, it's a fairly cheap thing to do, but they may not be that interested given that rice is, is not a major source of income for them at this time. Whereas for poorer farmers, those th those actual transition costs are enormous, about 67% of current annual income. But nonetheless, given their dependency on rice, this is enormously attractive to them if the finance is available. So it gives go uh, governments guidance on where to target the kind of finance that farmers need. Um, complicated graph here, but actually a very simple message. We keep on saying it all depends. Some practices are suitable somewhere. Other practices are suitable somewhere else. Farmers' behaviors are different anywhere, everywhere. Can we actually draw any generalizations? We've had the opportunity now to compare farmers' behaviors um, in terms of their adoption of new technologies, their adaptation actions across a huge range of sites around the world. And we find that there are some common factors. Um, access to weather information helps in many places, particularly in Asia, and membership of farmers' organizations is a, a strong enabler for, for behavioral change and adaptation. Similarly, when farmers talk about what actually makes them make a change, they will tend to mention both climate variability and market conditions, but market conditions are even more universal than climate variability. And it shows how strong market signals are likely to be. Again, something that can be influenced by policies in terms of actually prompting and nudging the kinds of changes ahead of time that we might like to see among farmers. Okay, so to summarize then, um, we believe that economic and financial assessments are really valuable tools um, to support decision making in some of the ways that I hope we've shown you now. Um, and some useful ingredients of getting that right are, are first of all, to really mainstream any economic assessment into both development policy and climate policy and to link those together. I think, I think we'll all agree in the room that we've moved beyond the age where agricultural develop, development happens on one trajectory and climate change action on another. Secondly, we think that it's helpful to break down the complexity by thinking through these immediate actions around current climate risks, medium term actions, which are about protecting your locked in investments, and then longer term foresight, uh, preparation, capacity building for our distant, more distant futures. We also believe that there does need to be this mix of farm level and landscape level actions, which are commonly seen with that much broader focus on non-technical capacity building, knowledge management, uh, building up of local organizations, and indeed the kind of policy work that can often be done cheaply um, that, that we have seen here, and which is a very, very strong and central component, at least of IFAD's approach to smallholder adaptation. Um, and finally, the message is things like net present value tell you one thing, rates of return tell you something else. This is financial and economic information, which is sometimes belied by farmers' real behaviors. Um, farmers are influenced by all kinds of factors. They may be cultural, um, they may be around access to finance or information, or indeed misinformation. Um, and that's why we also believe that in many cases, 
having some kind of theory of change of how a farmer's behavior does change and doing some kind of research to explore that and find out what are the enablers of change can be a extremely important information for um, NDCs and other uh, 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 climate planning, uh, excuse me, and other <laughs> climate planning mechanisms in agriculture. So I'm just getting a bit dry mouthed here. Uh, just to end on a note of both caution and optimism, um, as, as we know in this room, the nationally determined contributions add up to a much stronger statement of ambition than we might have expected a couple of years ago, but there's still not enough to achieve our shared global target of staying below two or closer to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, to, to reach that level of ambition, we will need to see ratcheting up in the future. And this presents both opportunities and challenges for agriculture, as we may be needing to move into new technologies and so on. On the note of optimism, however, some of the NDCs that have appeared, um, Colombia is among them, but that's just one of many, they are actually presenting a transformative view of the future, of how we can feed ourselves, how we can make massive land use and resource use um, decisions that affect everyone. So I'd like to end on that note of um, optimism. Um, we really are taking this now into a future where we don't just think small, we think really big, and we've got the economic information to support those decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, I'd like to, to now open it up to the panel to discuss some of these things. I mean, I think there's some really interesting issues in there at, at, at a variety of different levels. I wanted to ask uh, Chebet first. I know he can't stay with us uh, throughout the panel today, so we wanted to get some questions to him early. Um, You've identified agriculture in Uganda as, as, as really one of the things that you want to do as, as priority for your NDC. And you're talking about spending $476 million over the next 10 years on climate smart agriculture. Can you sort of talk us through how this costing was done and how you think further evaluation of costs and benefits is going to secure finance for agriculture? And just a little about what actually you're doing in Uganda or hope to do. So, okay, thank you very much, and uh, a very warm good evening to you all, distinguished audience. Uh, I don't know that I can be permitted just one second to express gratitude to CCAPS and organizers for this very important site event. So, from Ugandan perspective, certainly agriculture is one of the key sectors prioritized in a number of our policies including Uganda's national climate change policy and it is costed implementation strategy, including Uganda's nationally determined contribution. And the very recently, government of Uganda is in the advanced stages of finalizing the green growth development strategy. And we have a number of sectoral policies within the ministry, within agriculture itself. But all this underscores one thing, that indeed agriculture is the life span of the population of Uganda. And hence it is prioritization, including a five-year national development plan. So therefore, from the climate change perspective, we believe that agriculture has a number of core benefits in terms of contributing to emission reductions. And for some of you who are not familiar, with Uganda's NDC. The government of Uganda's NDC is premised on five key pillars. One in adaptation, which is the priority of the government of Uganda. Adaptation, and when you come to adaptation, agriculture stands as number one. Agriculture in the context of Uganda includes livestock, fisheries, and forestry, as well as aquaculture, yeah, fisheries, yes. And so, it stands out clearly, and that was the basis of the government of Uganda coming out and developing the Climate Smart Agriculture Strategy, which is part and parcel of elaborating the Uganda's NDC to see how 
we can then mobilize resources to go into full implementation of our CSA. And what has informed the costing of the $476 million over the next five years or so is precisely due to a number of assessments that have been undertaken. Initially, the minister, my minister where I sit from, where I'm working and I'm happy, I have one of us, the director for environment affairs, and the minister of Ugandan Minister of Water and Environment. The minister uh, 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 commissioned a study, economic assessment on the impacts of climate change in the key sectors of our economy. And this includes agriculture, the first one. We have water and the energy and the infrastructure with focus on human settlements. And it's very amazing that the study that was conducted across these key sectors, but across different agroecology, agroecologists in the country, came out with very, really, very, very interesting results. One, that the cost of not addressing the impacts of climate change for Uganda in the next five years is in the region of approximately 406 million US dollars. That's by the year 2020. 2025, it's about seven years. And if no action is taken, then that cost will be anywhere between 3.2 to 5.9 billion US dollars with a clear focus on agriculture, on what it means because of the extreme weather events, the droughts, the landslides and so forth, name it, for which the country has already experienced the recurrence over the years, particularly in the last 10 years. So. That is one basis of coming out with the costs on climate smart agriculture. But it also has a basis on what we call the, the, what we call the, the costings implementation strategy to Uganda's national climate change policy. We have a very detailed indicative costing based on some parameters. One, the national figures, the figures available in the country from the Bureau of Statistics and the Minister of Finance, and a number of other related studies. So if you go to the website, I can refer to your website, you can be able to see the indicative costs of the implementation strategy of Uganda's national climate change policy, including the agricultural sector is well detailed, whether it's crops, whether it's livestock, and the kind of proposed interventions and the inherent cost impl uh, implications. And this was further taken on when we are now developing the climate smart agriculture, which has this uh, 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 cost. So I do not want to take much time, but the point I would like to emphasize as I conclude is that that costing is not sufficient in terms of the government of Uganda implementing our nationally determined contribution. We have about five key sectors under adaptation. We also have about four or five sectors prioritized under our mitigation. And for agriculture, the CSA has both core benefits, adaptation with substantial core benefits in mitigation in terms of contribution to emission reductions and ushering into sustainable economic development. And for Uganda, we have two other cross-cutting areas, which I want to flash it out to this audience. The issue of gender is key and clearly highlighted in our Uganda's NDC, if you look at the website. And to that extent, we still have to do more work in terms of elaborating and putting costs on what it means on aspects of specific gender actions on the ground, particularly at the level of the, the farmer, the farmer level of actions. That, that has to be done a lot. The other one is respect for human rights when it comes to the impacts of climate change. This is again well enshrined in Uganda's NDC. So where we have gaps, however, is uh, some going into details of if we call, for example, per enterprise. If we say, I want to focus on aquaculture, I want to focus on maize, different agroecologies, we are yet to go in that detailed costing, disaggregated, and this way perhaps we may need uh, partners, including CCAPs and others, to help government come out with this cost, which can then inform decision taking in terms of investments. But on a positive note, as I conclude my intervention, the government of Uganda is committed from our NDC, if you read it, that government of Uganda 
who is committed to mobilizing up to 30% national resources from our budget in terms of addressing the climate change impacts in the next 15 years. And that the additional 70% of incremental costs are expected to be mobilized from other sources, partners, international sources. So the and therefore, finally, the Minister of Finance has issued a directive to all sectors in, to ensure that climate change is integrated in their sector budgets and plans beginning next financial year. And this is a positive note on our side. So we hope to have at least some little resources from some of the sectors to kickstart some of the key priorities on climate change, including, of course, agriculture. Thank you. Thanks. So, so what? So what's clear? There's still some things you need to figure out about some very specific areas. But, but what you do know is that you you need money. You can raise about thirty percent of it. You're going to need to find about seventy percent to do the things that you want to do, and uh, that that. So that's going to take some pretty good data in order to be able to go out and and try to track down that money. Then, um, Ilaria, from I, I was curious for you the this economic analysis that Sonia was talking about shows that there's been you know a really wide range of different investments in uh, in 32 different countries and a lot of them look like they're that they're working that they're, they're giving some kind of benefit that is um you know useful and interesting but for really different kinds of activities from strengthening local institutions enabling women's participation in decision making and markets and then through to you know more technical kind of solutions and and, and efforts uh, such as building resilient infrastructure and fighting soil erosion. I'm curious what kind of ongoing monitoring and evaluation you're gonna be doing to track those economic outcomes for farmers in the countries as this program is implemented and goes on. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. Um, well, uh, as, uh, as explained that the ASAP program as such as many, many different, uh, I mean, now we analyze 32, they are growing. We are now going up to almost 40 projects. Uh, uh, in different countries and different contexts. What we always do, uh, we have, uh, we normally embed uh, uh, indicators on household income and household asset ownership in the project monitoring evaluation system, which is part of the regular IFAD project monitoring system. But depending on the type of intervention, um, we may track uh, certain outcomes more specifically. So, for example, in the case of a project uh, that introduced a broader range of crop varieties, so as a diversification uh, approach to adaptation, we may monitor the outcomes in terms of yield increase and total value of the marketed commodities for each crop, for example or the increase uh, in uh, off farm income, uh, always if we push for diversification. But beyond that, uh, in, in some specific project, we undertake uh, specific studies with the support of external partners, like this one uh, with Sika and SIAT, which is really for us a very important one. Because of the, let's say that the question about the economic benefits of, of climate change adaptation has been there for a long time. And agriculture has always been perceived as a very risky business, which is true, of course, uh, especially when we talk about developing countries affected by extreme weather events. But thanks to this report, uh, we also can demonstrate uh, good opportunities and, and uh, real uh, payback. And uh, if, I, I think a few years ago, we would not have had uh, this kind of information. Today. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter, we've seen that one of the challenges to doing this kind of cost-benefit analysis is that farmers don't always behave in the ways that you, you think that they might. Uh, they come up with all sorts of unexpected behaviors and preferences. So, and, and what looks good on paper as you're drawing up an intervention isn't necessarily what's going to work in the field. What kind of research is your team doing to help climate interventions be more attractive to farmers, particularly women? Yeah, so, so those um, C cost and benefit analysis, the ex ante analysis, they often that do not take into consideration the heterogeneity of the population. So they assume that, that they're all more or less the same. And then there's like some adoption rate of 60 or 70% calculated. But obviously, we know that 
that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the field. So that's why we, we've started to go out and do like um, uh, sample the population to understand how um, their characteristics and start doing uh, farmer typologies so that we can then uh, better match the interventions to the different farm typologies. So one example that, that we saw in the, in the slides here is um, in southern Vietnam, moving from rice because there's uh, salt intrusion and um, higher higher uh, sea levels. So eventually rice can't be produced anymore. So moving to coconut or sugarcane. But if you then go out, so it sounds like perfect example, right? So you can move from rice to coconut or sugarcane. Sound, sounds really good. But if you then go to, to the field and, and interview those farmers, you will see that that um, the one that it's um, that's it's a high cost to to shift from from rice to coconut or sugarcane. So only uh, richer farmers could actually adopt such a practice. But if they, if you then look at those the profile of the farmers, you you can see that that um, the richer farmer only have like a small area in in rice. So they eventually are not that much interested in such a intervention. But then the smaller um, poorer smallholder farmers that would eventually be interested to shift to coconut, they, they wouldn't have the financial means to, to do that. So that, that's why it's important to understand the heterogeneity and the farm typology so that such interventions can then come with either training or financial support or loans. So we need to, to, to understand how, how those, um, yeah, the heterogeneity, as I said, of the farmers. And then uh, related to, to gender, obviously what, what, what we're trying to do is, uh, again, understand uh, who takes decision in the household, who has access to the resources. And then when you look at the, the projections of what crops are going to grow in the future, so how is this going to shift, for example, in many countries, um, women are more uh, in charge of uh, food security while men look after the cash crop, right? But then if uh, all of a sudden, for example, uh, coffee is not going to be um, suitable anymore and you, you'll shift to other crops. So how is this going to influence um, the, the role between men and women in terms of, of labor, of access to resources, of uh, decision making? So it's, it's really basically looking at the current situation of um, the gender and in interactions and then see how this is going to gonna change over time um, under progressive climate, climate change. Yeah, it's interesting that there, there can be that mismatch, you know, between desire and, uh, and, and ability and, and, and keeping that in mind when you try to figure these things out. Uh, Dada, we've been talking about how there, there does seem to be pretty good economic case for making some of these interventions. You know, the data is getting better and little by little we're sorting through some of these issues that Peter's been talking about. Um, but, but economic and financial information is just one part of the puzzle. What else needs to be in place to unleash large-scale finance for climate action and agriculture? Yeah, that's very true. Um, economic uh, information is just not enough. Um, this year, our project, ASEAN German Program on Response to Climate Change, which is a GIZ project, along with FAO, had been quite busy in assisting the ASEAN member states, so these are 10 countries, in translating INDCs to NDCs. And then, indeed, the question of, um, of financing, of course, is at the end of the day what countries are very interested in how to get to it. So I assume when we say large-scale finance for climate action, this is the big thing, which is GCF, for example, and, and, um, and adaptation fund. So the, indeed, the countries from ASEAN member states are, are quite busy preparing themselves to access this large-scale finance. But um, being involved with them, I could say that perhaps there are two uh, steps that really needs to be in place. One would be national coordinative mechanisms um, to, that will assure the funds that this will be in coordination with several ministries. Um, I could give you, for example, 
from Myanmar, they have already had a regional investment framework in which the ministries cutting across several ministries, finance, planning, um, and agriculture as the executing agency. And the task at the moment now is to integrate now some of the NDC's uh, priority into this regional investment framework. I think this is a good instrument to access these large scale funds. We have another example, even before the NDCs came out from Indonesia, which is the, and I'm sure some of you are familiar, on ICCTF, Indonesia Climate Change Trust Fund. And basically this has be really been supported by donors in order to really present a very credible source of um, financial management system that will attract large scale funds and even some small scale funds. Um, here I would say, um, there's just some issues here in which two ministries have different visions on and different economic figures or financial figures that come out from the Ministry of Planning and separate from the Ministry of Finance. And also agriculture has a different figure. So there you would see a difference in, in terms of um, ministerial coordination. And the second um, uh, need that I could see would be uh, really the ability of countries to leverage from their national budgets to make it, uh, to say that they have investment here that would attract the larger funds. Myanmar is doing this, for example, in accessing some GSCF fund into saying that they have 5 million in order to access 20 million and then 20 million from ADB. Um, Thailand, clearly says, though, has a different priority. Thailand said that they will never accept um, loans, so they are not interested in large-scale funds if it's a loan. Uh, yeah, I think these are some of the needs that uh, need to be in place for the countries. Yeah, it's a complex picture, isn't it? It's yeah. not, not a simple thing across all the countries. I'm, I'm curious for you and Ilaria, too, the, um, you know, it, it's, it's not uh, so hard to put a value sometimes on on some of the harder kinds of adaptation where you're building a dam or you're putting fertilizer in. But but when you start talking about building an effective women's group that can handle finance or the consulting genuinely with women, how how, how do you begin to put the value on that? That's a, it's a tricky thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a tricky thing, and I think this report shows also a bit how how tricky it is. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think uh, the, this analysis also shows that uh, that actually investing uh, in creating, you know, strengthening farmers organizations, women's group cooperatives uh, is uh, is really important. Uh, um, we, we just say, so in the presentation that these are maybe also driver of behavioral change. Uh, which uh, I mean, then means many things, including a better uptake of practices, but also uh, this strength and their voices in political processes, and therefore can have an impact in terms of uh, scaling up. I mean, we influencing policies and getting all these practices and technologies at a larger scale. And, uh, and of course, uh, um, once a smallholder cooperative is able uh, to participate in formal economic transactions, then uh, it, it really uh, generates a multiplier effect uh, by also the value chains in which uh, the cooperative is involved, is strengthened. And um, this is definitely, um, I mean, that this end up contributing to the growth in the agricultural sector of an entire country. So, and IFAD is very, very committed to work uh, with, with farmers' organization and uh, it's, it's always been uh, collaborative with the uh, with farmers' group uh, and even host every two years a farmers' forum uh, where all different farmers' organizations from all the continents are put together and discuss uh, issues including climate change, of course. So you think that there really is a way to show that there's value for money in these kind of yeah, invention. yeah, I definitely okay. think so. You yeah. agree as well, though? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm curious for all of you, you know, presumably you're here tonight at this hour when you should be out having dinner and, and uh, relaxing after a long day, that, that you, you, you're interested in agriculture and think that probably investment in it is, is important. How, how many of you really think that there is enough 
investment in agriculture right now? No. Okay. Who, th who thinks that we're halfway there? Okay. 25%? Okay. Less? Is that the rest of you? Okay. So there's still quite a long way to go on this then. But most of you think. Okay, why don't you go ahead? Do we have a microphone here? We'll, no, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a few questions here for the panel. We've, we've got some time to handle those, so let's go ahead and you can be first. Now look at that, sneaking in here. Uh, Richie with Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, so really quickly, uh, you know, excellent point, Laurie, about you know, how, do, what, how much investment is needed. That question is not really studied well enough, I think. I mean, if I were to look at all the investments, in, the countries are in the business of development, they're investing a lot in agriculture, but, and it's great to hear that people here are talking about climate investments and the ROIs on those and what the NPV is, what's gonna happen. But are there strong financial metrics for normal agriculture investments using good topology, good metrics to figure out what's going on? And so on that basis, if we can say that, look, there's a hundred million being invested into agriculture in a given year, uh, what are the returns? How, how well is this money being utilized? Can we make it more efficient? And, and, and what are the climate impacts? So, I mean, that stuff is not really fully understood at the moment. What do you think? Is that getting easier? I think that's what we've been talking about. How, how close are we to being there? Anyone? I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm, I'm happy to come in on this. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit, I think that circle diagram we showed of, of the way that different countries are looking at it shows that in a sense it's that how long is a piece of string question. So really in essence we could invest more and more and more, there's no upper limit to how much we could invest in agriculture. I think the interesting question then comes in where you're making the hard choices about do I put the money here or do I put it there? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I'm the person, per permanent business of asking questions and being self-critical. So I would say, when I look at some of these figures, that even when you can demonstrate that your investments in agriculture are going to pay off, are they better than doing something else? So I was at a nutrition meeting a few days ago, and they were producing some very, very convincing figures about uh, the ways in which nutrition programs that cut across food production, but also look at gender equality, uh, sanitation, healthcare, maternal care, that they have fantastically good returns. And these are proven returns over decades. So, you know, when you compare things side by side, uh, you know, th that's how you need to make the case. But again, to qualify what I've just said, I, I think it's important that economic tools are only one part of any decision. I mean, ultimately, these things are not based on what gives the best cost benefit ratio or the best net present value. There are a whole bunch of political and social priorities going into that. And that's really, in the end, how we make our decisions. Thanks. Yeah, done. Um, yeah, and actually, when you look at the NDCs and um, in, in ASEAN, the priorities for NDCs are like on water management, climate planning and policy, um, reflecting the report, climate information services, water irrigation infrastructure. These things sound like high level investments, right? But then there are pockets in our experiences in which on, in agriculture, in which it only takes $5,000 for a knowledge ex exchange on how, for example, um, Laos that needs this kind of corn that could cover the whole corn because they said that they only have a corn that has half is halfway covered and being affected by the drought and 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 Thailand offers to assist them with their specific kind of tolerant maize seedlings so these are like small investments that show very short term result you don't really need to count what profit at the end of this would come out. It's really a very clear need, very obvious need. So these are like some of the immediate agriculture investments that could be supported. Mm -hmm. And even by very small development agencies could, could do this. 
Gloria, did you want to say yeah, something? Uh, maybe just, yeah, also to add on this, uh, I, I think there are very small investments that can be supported, but at the same time, I think when we talk about uh, investing in agriculture, we should also consider two major aspects. One is related to governance, which is key. I mean, all this course around uh, tenure access rights and so on, which is, uh, I mean, can uh, go on another side with investment in agriculture and also I think capacity building. I mean, in IFAD we believe a lot on the fact that uh, investment in capacity building of, I mean, private uh, and public extension service and so on are, are really key. So this is considered for as part of the climate finance investment in agriculture. Chabot, I'm, I'm curious from you, that we've been talking a little bit about Sonia was saying that it really is a complex picture because you've got to look at agriculture and other options and do this with, you know, with a broader goal of making sure that people have enough to eat, that people have resilient livelihoods that are going to get them through more uncertain times. And then you've got to do it within the framework of what the country's priorities are and, and the donors' priorities. How, how do you sort that out in Uganda? Uh. First of all, I must say that agriculture is a sector that does not receive enough investment as it deserves. And this is from my personal experience. And therefore, I'm tempted to say that quite often we pay lip service to real investments in agriculture. And why am I saying that? Every document after document will always reckon the importance of agriculture. But this does not match with the corresponding investments, whether for investments actions or related to strengthening, whether you want to call it governance, institutional arrangements, capacity enhancements, and so forth. There's a mismatch in my view. So what can be done? This is the question I'd like to pose perhaps to development partners. <laughs> Amas with give us the ammunition in terms of the requisite data and uh, figures. Sometimes few economists are convinced when they see facts and figures. And I want to give you a typical example where I'm born. It's a rural area. The local people are demanding for tarmacking of the road because it was affecting agriculture production. Can't get market and so forth. This is Mount Elgon region. Those who know Uganda, in the eastern part of Uganda, it was no road. The wind was raining. And then the economists will tell you there's no return on investment in that area. First of all, you look at the fleet of vehicles. That's in the justify an economic sense to invest. But at some point, we used political pressure and part of the road was stomached and the results are amazing for any economist to see what that investment has leveraged in terms of productivity, production, and all other aspects of development in that area. So this is where perhaps for those who are pure economists, I don't know how you need to balance the economics in your books, but those are the experts. Me, I'm not an expert an economist. And that same thing also applies the contribution of natural resources for the case of uganda including support to agriculture is heavily dependent on our natural resources the waters the rivers the forests the wetlands and so forth that connectivity is there whether it is for power generation and so forth it's there but quite often again the expert economists don't know how to take this into account and that's the difficult we get and consequently those who are responsible for budget allocations do not justify putting more money where it should go actually to or where it should get. So this is the, the triple iron that we face ourselves, uh, some of us. And I think this now the researchers, the economists who can help us come out with a strong basis, which can then guide anybody to invest wisely where we need most for our people. Thank you. Peter, you're dying to jump in there. <laughs> uh, it just reminded me, I was yesterday at the NAMA facility session, and so they were talking about all the NAMAs that have been financed, 
and in fact, there's only one on agriculture, which is the coffee one in, in Costa Rica. So I, so I ask why, I mean, since 20, 30 percent of the emissions in, in um, developing countries come from the agricultural sector, why don't we see more, more NAMAS financed, right? And so it, it really came down to if you have like some refrig refrigerator supply chain, it's much easier to come up with those numbers because you just get your electricity bill, your gas mm -hmm. bill. But for agriculture, it's just a little bit more complicated. And maybe this is also w w what you're saying, right? So where, where are the numbers and, and how re reliable are those numbers? And so there's, um, I mean, that's yeah, definitely something that, that we all have to, to work on, right? Mm -hmm. I know Tuppet's got to leave us very soon. Does anybody have a question for him particularly so we don't miss out? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to supplement uh, um, what Mr. Chibet has said. My name is Paul Mafabi. I'm from Uganda. And yes, maybe one of the key factors is the fact that uh, our agriculture, especially here in, in Africa, is nature based. So it's taken for granted that things will grow anyway. So you don't have to invest too much because even if you don't, uh, the, the things will grow. But what happens that they grow in very small quantities and then we end up in a vicious circle because small quantities is not encouraging you to even invest more. So maybe uh, one, one approach is to look at a value chain approach that will address a number of uh, issues, including uh, post-harvest losses, among others. But while I have the, uh, the mic, I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, the keynote talked about the movement from rice to coconut. Mm -hmm. And in Uganda, we're actually developing a similar program of building resilience, um, trying to encourage our communities to move from rice growing uh, to some other thing so that we can protect the wetlands. Now, I wanted to know what is the success rate? Uh, it seems like some were accepting, others were not accepting. Mm -hmm. So what is the success rate? Sounds like one for you, Peter. Do you know? Again, that, that's just, a, I mean, it hasn't been implemented. It's an ex ante analysis, but it, it boils down to, to knowing your, the profile of your farmers. I mean, who can, so if by success rate, I assume you mean uh, adoption rate, right? So it's, it's important to know, to know who will uh, finally adopt those practices. So that's why it's important to match those interventions or practices, packages, to your farmer typologies. If you assume that everybody is the same, then then that's uh, that yeah doesn't bring you as close as as. So it's important to to know who lives there, what's their livelihoods, how they're organized, and and all this. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Okay, Dad, please go ahead. I think this question was asking a side event that we were in today also but as you know rice is very very important for the people of southeast asia and in in this beyond economic question was more like is it really possible that they're going to shift mm -hmm. and um and this was not answered during that side event but we we could cite several examples of the appeal beyond um as Peter showed some economic incentives, for example, that works. But in, in the Philippines, for example, there are some health appeals now that says, you know, eating too much rice, you need to substitute it with other carb, uh, carb substitutes. So this could be some uh, apart from the economic incentive to shift to, to this for creating a demand for the alternative to a major commodity. Can I, can I ask you in the audience one more question? I'm curious whether you see the lack of investment in the agriculture as, a, as essentially an economic problem or essentially a political problem. Who, who thinks it's an economic problem? Who thinks it's a political problem? Okay, so politics is, is the issue. Uh, has anybody else got a question they'd like to ask the panel? Yeah, please. I think it's not, uh, now it's working. Perfect. Uh, so my, my question is, my name is Sinidra, I'm from Brazil, and uh, it's more in the in the field of uh, credit transactions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like uh, having money is a very important uh, thing, right? But it's giving the, cre giving the cre credit and putting the credit to work is another issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to know from, 
your point of view and your the countries you you were working uh how are you prepare preparing farmers to get this credit in in use this credit in a, in a way we want to in a, in or how are you working with banks in in the credit institutions to prepare them to give this credit to the farmer who'd like to answer that one Peter. yeah so this is a very good question it, so it boils down to scaling right scaling of adoption of practices so we we've been starting to look into that and work with like micro loan like root capital and those type of organizations to help them climate proof um, their loans so to make sure that they that they give loans to farmers to do the climate smart or the right thing right so it's more on on the other side we don't in that case we don't assist the farmers but assist the intermediaries or the ones that give out the the, the loans well I'll, I'll, I'll jump in from a session i was in earlier today where they were um it was on it was on gender and climate change and there were a bunch of very strong women in the audience who were holding the africa Development Bank to account, and it led to an interesting discussion. And actually, the Africa Development Bank has got um, an interesting new program called AFAWA, and it stands for Agricultural Finance for African Women in Agriculture. And they are trying to get over what this is an incredible statistic that 70% of agricultural work is done by women, but less than 1% of agricultural credit in Africa goes to women. Mm. And there are massive barriers behind that, right? I mean, the impossibility of collateral when you don't own land and things like that. So they're really trying to tackle this at, at multiple levels. So it's, it's going down to like the most kind of local levels around um, uh, making sure that, you know, local women's groups um, and, and kind of revolving credit funds and stuff are empowered up to providing at the higher level the kind of, continent-wide institutional environment that um, can can provide um, essentially the the core capital um, to uh, to, uh, to guarantee the loans but what's happening at the moment is that the basic attitude of commercial banks in african countries is that lending to women is risky they're not interested in in that but by providing a way to actually do risk pooling at a higher level they're beginning, they hope, to break down those kind of barriers. Just some thoughts, thanks. Yeah. Got it. Uh, not related to, related to credit lending. Um, what the ASEAN region seems to be being engaged now with high interest, level of interest is risk transfer mechanisms or climate informed uh, agriculture insurance mechanisms. And there seems to be emerging some very good models from the Philippines seems to have a very long history of success on with the Philippine Crops Insurance Corporation. Uh, farmers get premiums from impacts of climate change. And uh, Vietnam is in its second phase of um, agriculture insurance system. So this is not credit lending, but a different way of uh, transferring risk uh, from the farmer from climate change impacts. Thank you. And I just wanted to bring some uh, IFAD experiences on that. Uh, apart from yeah, some experience with the uh, weather index insurance, which is closer to what uh, Dada was mentioning, but more to bring examples of what Sonia was saying, uh, we have uh, some of the projects uh, that has uh, like uh, actions on one side in strengthening cooperatives, women's group. Uh, in order for them to access credit but when uh, it comes to like big uh, adaptation uh, actions such as for example uh, storage infrastructure that are climate proof uh, something which is very expensive also for a group uh, the project provides a part of the financing in a way that uh, for the financing institution the risk uh, is much reduced uh, and so th this is for example an approach uh, that that work in some context. It's really, really interesting, actually, I think how those things fit together, isn't it? That, that if you talk about these soft adaptations where you get women involved and, and make sure their voices are in there and give them capacity, then maybe that, you know, you build a women's group to a finance group, then maybe that lowers some of those risks and makes it more possible for the money to come. You had a question? 
Hi. Um, I work at Chatham House on sustainable diets um, and the need to uh, promote a global reduction in meat consumption as a, a means of tackling climate change. Um, there's been growing evidence and a number of studies come out recently suggesting that global, global convergence around healthy levels of meat intake um, hold greater emissions reduction potential than all supply side mitigation measures put together in terms of food production and livestock production. Um, I mean, it's somewhat tangential, and of course, when you're talking about demand side mitigation measures, you're really talking about a different group of countries from what you've been discussing today. Mm -hmm. But are any of you doing any work on uh, promoting the inclusion of demand side uh, mitigation measures in the food sector in agriculture within the NDCs of developed countries and potentially emerging economies? And do you see any potential for that to happen? Creating change with your mask. Somebody, somebody would like to speak over here. To the point. Go, go yeah, ahead. Got, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, my name is Meryl Richards, and I work for CCAFs in our low emissions development flagship team. Um, the short answer is a little bit, but not a lot. Um, we are. We actually just commissioned a review looking into the potential for investigating. Um, supply side emission reduction solutions in agriculture. As you said, the major reason that we haven't focused on it so far is because CCAFs and the CGIAR as a whole is focused on smallholders in developing countries. And so, you know, this, as you said, the problem is in, is really in developed countries. Um, but within the value chain, not necessarily diet focused, um, there may be a larger potential in the countries where we work for um, addressing things like post-harvest loss um, and, you know, those sorts of supply side, but sort of along the value chain um, kind of solutions. Um, so that's that's sort of the short answer for now. So, so not a lot, but we are looking into it a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one coming from the back as well. <laughs> Hi, John Lewis, Terra Global Capital. Mm -hmm. um, in a former life, I was a day director of agriculture and funded most of these CG centers. And before that, I worked for one of them. And I remember I was on the oversight committee of the system, and I remember Norman Borlaug saying used to attend our meetings when he was still alive, that the next green revolution will not really be associated with any of the crops that are associated with my name being maize mm -hmm. and wheat or Mr. Swaminathan's name, mm -hmm. Rice. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly the archeological history of human agriculture is that annual crops favor patriarchal societies and deserts. <laughs> and, and in those days we used to call the sort of forest friendly crops, the orphan crops, because no research was done on them and you'd have a CG meeting and there'd be rice breeders and wheat breeders and maize breeders and say, what should we do next? And it would be rice, wheat. And um, now our company works a lot on nitrous oxide and methane reductions from irrigated rice, but looking back into the tropics, uh, there's a huge potential for trees. I mean, there's just no question that these numbers require trees. And food does grow on trees. And, and yet, when you talk about climate smart agriculture, you never hear a sort of differentiation between annual, perennial, the biodiversity potential of um, growing lots of different things, whether they be agroforestry value chain crops, which tend to have a role for men or local forest garden subsistence crops, which need to be consumed locally because transporting them in markets and granaries and so on would have a huge carbon footprint. So um, when this comes up now, our company works a lot on red, when it comes up in terms of co-benefits and red, uh, there's a certain knowledge in a lot of countries, this be enormously empowering for women who control these tree crops, even if they don't, aren't allowed to own land and so on. And the and discussion sort of stops there. And so I've been curious how the orphan crop, women's empowerment in agriculture. I mean, it's 
microfinance, you know, works and it works best with women. So that always comes up. But what about trees? Uh, okay, you can't count tubers, you can't transport them very easily, but there are local marketing systems, they can move around. Anyway, I was part of a panel with, and I'll stop here, uh, called Agrimond with Syrad and Inran in France, and they were doing what they call a prospective. And they really felt their various scenarios sort of led to collapse, looking a century out, running all the numbers. But not a local vor scenario, peri-urban agriculture, local vor stuff. But of course, the ag economists resisted this because you can't count all this stuff. But not everything that can be counted counts. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, my question's about perennial crops with or without women's empowerment. Well, women's empowerment would be crucial. What do you think about trees? Can you count them? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just from the from an economics perspective here, and when we cover this in the report, so when you look across the set of kind of services that you might implement, they range from insurance through to climate information services. That there's the one that I presented there that really stood out, um, and and that's getting weather forecasts to farmers. It it works everywhere it's been looked at. Um, and for the others, the evidence is much more weak. It works here, doesn't work here. It has all of these contextual factors. Now, when you look at the kind of farm level practices, which I rushed through, the farm landscape level practices, we have a similar kind of spread. So we've looked, for example, in enormous detail at these mechanisms for um, alternate wetting and drying and rice and why it works here and not there and so on and so on. But there's one, and now you're, you still get to trees, that really stands out is that when you review agroforestry interventions of introducing trees onto farms, they seem to work just about everywhere. Of course, they don't always take the same form. Um, it's not in every single, um, you know, agro ecosystem that you could feed the entire population off the trees. But nonetheless, the diversity that they bring into people's income streams and into people's diets, um, and also the fodder for livestock, um, plus, of course, the stabilizing effects that they have on all kinds of environmental factors, some um, local water runoff, uh, temperature control, all kinds of things. It just does mean that you're totally right. Trees are a no-brainer. Yeah, I think that also um, I, we work quite a bit on disaster risk reduction that, you know, you hear lots of stories of people whose crops are wiped out by floods or something and the, you know, the fruit up in the tree is still, still there and accessible. So they've got quite a lot of benefits, I think. Uh, we're getting to the close to the end here. Is there any other questions? Well, yeah, but I know it's late. It's, it's been a long day. And believe me, for Americans, it's been an even longer day. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. <laughs> but let me just sum up some of what we've been hearing tonight that, uh, that I'm interested in and uh, that I think are some takeaway messages from this. You know, we've been asking this question of what what holds back investment in in ag if there if there's a case for this, and and it's in nearly all of the NDCs. I mean, is it what what is it that does that? Is it just that there are so many competing demands for the limited supply of money that's available? Is is it that the you know the economic case isn't isn't proven as well? I think we're kind of hearing tonight that that is getting there that we're, we're understanding a lot more clearly than we did at one point about, about what those benefits are. And, or, or is it politics, which is what you've been telling me is the problem. So maybe that's where uh, some of the effort needs to go to uh, sort this out. Um, I think we talked quite a lot about women and I was really happy about that because I, I see that as well in, in uh, the stories that we hear and, and come across to you know that having women involved in this in a real way and not in a symbolic way, but in you know actually being consulted, being part of savings groups, having real access to credit, to finance, to, to things that make sense for them is, is what's really gonna build resilience and, and, and help this investment in agriculture work on the ground. I, I also like some of the discussion about the soft investment. You know, I think sometimes when people think about agriculture, they think first about the new seed varieties or the new, techniques of the new equipment. But but putting in this time of capacity building is is huge. 
and it's what's um, really going to help a lot to to make the stuff take off and 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 to make these investments pay off. So it was great to see that in some of the um, the studies that that's really being looked at and the value of that's being recognized and and even even you know put put in a very quite specific dollar terms now and and i think that we have to keep in mind as well when we think about this issue the costs of not investing i think that's pretty easy to look at all around the world you know look at southern africa these days with the the drought and people that don't have access yet to you know any range of these kind of things that we've talked about tonight and what the prices are i know Chevet was was talking about that in uganda that you know you can look at what it costs to do the investment in agriculture and then if you look at what the cost is to not do it those numbers are so much higher that's got to contribute to the case for for making this happen um thank you for coming tonight and uh, please remember, there's going to be a, uh, if you want to continue the discussion outside, there's going to be a reception immediately after just out here. So it might be a, a really nice place to carry on these conversations if you've got any additional questions for anyone that's here. But thank you. Appreciate you coming out.